Thank you for not flying American. Uh, it's good to see you here. Uh, and I, I assume soon we'll see a, a new CSI where the, uh, the DNA says the butler did it, you know? Um, well, let's talk a little bit about uh, innovation secret sauce, and, uh, which was originally titled Deeds, Wants, and the, uh, the Future of Engineering. So, so what do you do? You know, we've heard a lot of bad news when uh, one war is ending, maybe another on the way, economic uncertainty, failing infrastructure, health care a mess, people dying too soon, nine million immigrants in a decade, how do we accommodate them, and issues about globalization and jobs. And to think that all this was from 1900 to 1910. So uh, that's one perspective on some of the issues. The other perspective that I'd like to talk about though is the power of engineers and engineering to change a lot of this. The uh, National Academy of Engineering looked back at, at, uh, a little while ago at what had happened in just a hundred years. And it was, it's, it's amazing how life was transformed by our brethren and the kind of tools that engineers use. Uh, electrification. I mean, literally, you, you know, we were, we were dealing with oil lamps. Uh, the automobile, the whole PLM, PDM sort of industry is built primarily on these two industries which didn't really even exist at the beginning of the century. Uh, water supply and distribution. I put a baby carriage down at the bottom of the, of the uh, page here. How many folks here are kind of like pushing 45 or over the edge? <laughs> yeah. Well, I hate to tell you, but most of you would be dead in, in 1900 because in 1900, the average life expectancy of a white male was 45 years. Some of that infant mortality and the rest. And it is now 75 years. And that 30 years didn't come from, so much from doctors as it came from sanitation, refrigeration of f fuel, uh, safer food, those, those kind of issues that have gotten there. So that was a heck of a run. And the challenge we really have in front of us is, well, what's that going to look like for the next 100 years? What are we going to do and how are we going to respond? And, and I'm going to give you a little bit of the bad news first in this, that in those 100 years, there was an amazing, an absolutely amazing, you might call secret sauce for innovation. And it was the businesses here, mostly in the United States, that knew how to make that sauce. Uh, social scientists often have this little acronym called POET. They look at problems from what, what are the skills that people bring to it, how are things organized, what's the infrastructure, the environment, do they have resources, and what are the technology that you know, we're so familiar with. So we'll look at what that amazing, amazing secret sauce was. Well, in terms of people, we had this vigorous workforce in the melting pot. We had young, ambitious people trying to climb the ladder and in general, every new wave of immigration made us stronger. You know, I mean, there's some, like, should we let Albert in? Well, I guess Einstein's okay. And you know, we, had, we just benefit tremendously of every wave of immigration. We had, unique in the planet this time, this educational meritocracy. There was education for everyone. It wasn't completely equal, but there was a sense, if you were a bright kid, you could take the next step, and the next step, and the next step. And that was, that was an incredible advantage. We had shared values, the American dream. You know, there, out of all of this diversity, people thought, this is the place to be. We, we've got something going on here, a real pride. And, and Yankee ingenuity, whether it was the farm version or the Yankee ingenuity, and, and national heroes like Lindbergh and Edison and Ford and Einstein, and uh, that, was, that was the people part. And so we had, in essence, the, the most productive, both thinking and working workforce you know, in the globe. In terms of organization, we had motivated and often cheap labor. Cheap labor is an interesting thing. A lot of times it comes back and, and bites you, but we certainly had people who were motivated. Uh, scientific, you know, to think of back to Taylor, uh, our, we, we created the idea of MBA schools. You had GE and the GM, you know, with their own schools. We had the best run businesses on the planet. Um, free markets, you had, a, you had a better idea, an opportunity to do it. And then this is a real key, low crime, we've, we've always had crime and corruption. But, but it was relatively low here, so you had a sense if you did something, somebody wasn't going to take it from you. 
This is still an issue of, in countries like India and China, but but that was so we were organized to to, to innovate. It was just uh, it, it was working there. And then the environment. So the environment is you know we're, what's all the stuff you can put it into it. We had cheap energy. The question you know how did we get 25% of the you know the energy you know in in the world you know with so few people? Well, it was there for the taking. It seemed infinite. And we had the technology to get it. And abundant natural, we had water, we had fresh water, we had timber, we had coal, we had steel. It was all here. I mean, it, it, it was just, for an industrial economy, it was just like, like pulling off of trees. Savings and business, if you're an economist, you think savings and business investments, the whole story. You look at the savings rate and the investment rate, and that predicts. Uh, the thing. Now there are these other 15 ingredients, but it's an important one, and we had that going for us. And even today, we've got the venture capital kind of kind of uh, set up that's there. We had the world's leading public and private infrastructures. You know, you go back to our ports were new and the best in the world. Yeah, they had they had trains in in, in Europe, but ours were new. We did things like rural electrification and put it out there. We built the interstate highway so we had the brightest, shiniest, most productive infrastructure around. And, and something that you know, is, is, is maybe, uh, maybe an accident but was a sure lucky one is that while most every other advanced nation had battles fought on its ground in both World War I and World War II, they were not fought here. And that's one of the reasons that the, the world ended up with this dollar-denominated currency. This was the safe haven. They were not those are the most productive. So that was working for us. So you couldn't have asked for a better environment. And in terms of technology, we had leadership, in part coming out of the universities. The investments we made in our schools paid us back not only in people, but in these seed ideas. And we also had, in terms of our companies, uh, more R&D spent, I mean, the, the IBMs of the world, you know, through the 70s and the rest of that. So basic research and patents. We were the innovators in process innovation. I mean, if you, if you take lean design, it started in the Chicago meatpacking industry. And then Henry Ford looked at it and said, I can do that. And only later did the Toyota folks come over and say, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll update that and, and use it for ourselves. And we had this whole systems integration wave. I mean, you know, whether it's uh, ERP or PLM or whatever, we found the tools, the, the entire IT evolu uh, revolution was here of a way of gluing stuff together to make it even more productive. And, and we had this, this, this relentless focus on cool products. Unlike a lot of nations, two-thirds of our GMP comes out of people who want the latest and greatest cool thing. And so that was working for us. So these, to me, were the 16 secret magic ingredients that made us the most innovative, the richest, and along the way, the most powerful you know, culture over the last 100 years. So that's a, that's a little bit of a look past. It's an amazing run, but there's a little bit of bad news. It's no longer a secret. In fact, I'm going to go ingredient by ingredient and kind of give a status update on where each of these, each of these things is. So let's, uh, let's run through and talk about people first. This is no longer the work, if, 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 if someone's willing to outsource and it's going like crazy, this is no longer the workforce of global choice. And in fact, if we think, of, like anybody, how many folks flew here? And how many of you had like these incredibly excited, motivated stewardesses just who really want to work? <laughs> I mean, that you, yeah, you see, you were lucky. So, so uh, it used to be that was, that was a lot of people's dream job. I actually sat next to a woman who used to be a stewardess, you know. And, but now you get on the plane and they've been like through three labor agreements and their jobs been cut twice and they've been doing this for 30 years and they're pissed. And they're kind of like, how are you? Would you like the little snacky cracker? You know, and, and so motivation's an issue. Um, and, then, and then we've got age and that, that demographically we're an older society. De demographics is actually, you know, one of the, it's been pointed out how it's great that China has had the one child policy, but China is actually facing an economic time bomb. They, they've got you know, old folks to take care of and not enough young there. We're actually relatively unique amongst advanced societies, mainly because of immigration and, and having a little less than a 2.0, a little bit more than a replacement, you know, type, type thing. But by and large, we're older. 
and that, that's something there. And, and, our, and our melting pot, you know, it's always been contentious, but now, we're, now it's like on the front pages, keep those immigrants out of here. You know, Einstein, turn away, and you too, Jose. Um, education is less of an advantage. At the, at, the, at the levels of elementary schools and, and high schools, if you look at science and engineering, we're sitting down 10th, 15th in the world. There are a dozen company, countries ahead of us. We're, we're not even at parity at that level. Our universities are still good, but even they, you know, it's it no longer do the world's brightest necessarily want to come here to get an education. I mean, it's wonderful that, you know, like a kid from Russia wants to go to Stanford and maybe later starts a company, as he did with Google. But, but that attraction is waning. Uh, breakdown of shared values. How many folks are here from a blue state? And how many folks are from a red state? Uh, we, we've got these bitter divides that, that, uh, amongst us. And if you think about the heroes, like uh, when was the last time that we spent a lot of time talking about our Lindberghs and, and the rest of that? It's, it's like, who's on rehab and when do they get out and what do they do to their kids? Pardon? Barry Bonds. Yeah, Barry Bonds. Yeah, I mean, he, there's, there's one of... So, so literally, literally the role models, and this is a soft thing, people don't talk about it, but you, know, you put a role model in front of a kid this, this, this old and you wonder why they don't become engineers later, well, that might, be, that might have something to do with it. So, so the culture has gone from self-improvement, this relentless, I've got to get better, my kids have got to do better than me, to almost, you know, it's one thing if you're Larry Ellison and you're, and you're self-absorbed. You know, well, maybe you, you cut him a little slack, maybe he deserves it. But, but if you're like, you know, not capable, I mean, if you're like a, you know, a barista at Starbucks, what are you so self-absorbed about? So that's, that's where we are in terms of the workforce. And, ter you know, it used to be said that what's good for GM is good for the country. And, and a, lot of, a lot of our economic progress came through the organization of really competent, well-organized, big companies. And at that point, what was good for GM or General Electric or Ford or U.S. Steel or Cincinnati Millicron, I mean, you go on and on, was good for the country. Well, try to tell that now to anybody in Detroit. The middle class, from, from being the heart you know, both the thinking and the, and the kind of working has become disillusioned. Out of jobs, the rest of that. It often looks, you know, one health indicator for companies is how many Dilbert cartoons are posted on the cubicles. Because it often seems like Dilbert's boss is in charge. Uh, it turns out that our vaunted free markets, when we start really looking carefully, aren't as free as we thought. That uh, it turns out that corn for ethanol is a net energy loser and the only way that Archer Daniel Midland can make any money is because you, every one of us, are twice subsidizing their profits. It turns out in Enron that they weren't absolute geniuses in making energy, they were geniuses in ripping people off. And if, in fact, if you look at your own economics over the last uh, uh, seven years, um, just about everybody in this room has, has had 50 grand pulled out of your pocket because the national debt, you know, which accumulated over a century, has doubled in the last seven years. Your share of that doubling, if you have a family of four, is 50 grand. So that's 50 grand out of your pocket. Now, anybody here have a, like a, an IRA or a retirement program? And how's that been doing? It's been going up 7% a year and so, so something there. And does anybody here own a house? Anybody own a house like in the Bay Area where I am? So, I mean, if I actually add at what the last seven years have cost me, it's maybe three, four, five hundred grand. And, 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 and in terms of innovation, it's, it's kind of a shame that some of our very best and very brightest aren't there thinking about how to add value, but how to kind of like extract and skim a little off the top. So, so like, like this whole last subprime thing was the equivalent of really, really smart financial people taking an old wreck of a car and painting it like new and selling it as new. And now we're the ones paying for that sort of thing. So that's, that's kind of a bummer. So we've gone from this big company pride, I, I work for IBM and I'm going to be there for my life, to outsourcing and anger. All right, sustainability. So if we look at the uh, uh, issues of the environment, we're facing huge conflict over resources. You can call 
the various wars we've got, you know, wars for democracy or wars for whatever, um, but there's no question that there is contention for oil. You don't, and we don't often hear as much about contention for chromium and, and gold and, and the rest of that, but that's there. And there are other countries that want that stuff. And, and you can add the climate change on top of it. We are no longer in an age of, of you know, the resources are there for the grabbing. Every single valued resource from water to particularly oil right now is something people are fighting over. Uh, we have become the world's largest debtor nation. You know, we used to, when we grew up, we were talking about, oh, those poor people, they don't pay their debts, and, you know, why are we giving them foreign aid and stuff like that? We are now the world's largest debtor nation. Uh, in terms of our public, you know, stocks and goods, we have gone from about 1% to 20% are now owned in foreign hands. This is a little bit like if you said, you know, I want a really big house and I can't afford it, so could you, Saudi Arabian prince, could you, could you kind of like handle part of my mortgage for me? And then you wake up and it's 2008 and he's living in the bedroom because that's his part. That's what we've done to ourselves. Um, and, and, and it isn't just that we've got, you know, other people owe us and they owe us. We are literally a net debtor right now. We're, we're the people we used to deride. If you look at, you know, where we're, what are we shipping to China? Is it like high-tech goods? No, it's, it's coal and it's steel and it's, you know, it's, we, we have become a third world exporter for the exports we do. And in terms of uh, uh, public and private infrastructure, you know, I just got back from China and their roads look great. My town doesn't even know how to fix the potholes. And, and we've got bridges collapsing, we're not making the investment. China invests 20% of its gross domestic product in infrastructure and, and we're not even doing replacement level. Other nations are investing in broadband and we're arguing about whether AT&T and other people get to cut up the pot and stuff like that. In terms of, of these protected shores, now there are very real threats about nuclear pro proliferation. We have homeland insecurity. And, and even there's this thought of this, maybe the dollar's moving to the euro. So my point about this is that just about every single element of those 16 parts of our secret sauce is either now at parity or we've lost parity on it. And that's what we have to confront over the next century. And, and so the takeaway that I want you to have from that, oh, techno, I didn't do technology yet, darn. Parity and basic research, uh, process innovation is now moving aboard, systems integration. How, how many, is anybody here like a, a user at a big company, like at a Boeing or a Ford or GM, anybody? Anybody? What, what company? Parker. Parker, yes, yeah, so Parker Hannafin. So you guys have experimented with every single like uh, bill of material management system in the world. And, 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 that, and, and because of this incredible investment now you're like making 20% profits and growing like crazy, right? Yeah. So I mean, the, the point is there's this disillusionment that when you, you, when you get a big systems integration project it takes too long and by, at the end of the day you got the same, and the business hasn't changed that much. The bloom is off some of the stuff. And there's consumer and product fatigue. You know, it, it's interesting, now we're all going to get our like 600 bucks. Because the consumers, we consumers, two-thirds of the GMP, have always bailed out the product. So people are going to rush down to Walmart and, you know, buy like a big screen TV made in China. And that's somehow going to have some like, like enduring effect on the economy. I mean, hopefully there will be this kind of, oh, we can rest now, the economy's good, and that'll, that'll string things along for a little bit better, but it might be a lot better to convince people, rush down to Walmart and buy energy-saving light bulbs, so at least you'll have something three years down the road that's paying you back some money. So the technology is not quite as dim as some of the others, but we, we've gone from undisputed leadership, in some cases, to a struggle for relevance. You know, we used to argue about, you know, can we get data between PTC and CATIA? Well, you know, if it's all going to be in China, who cares? You know, I mean, so, so, <coughs> my point is this is not just another economic cycle. All of us are hoping in our heart of hearts, just like, when, remember when I did the dot-com thing, the dot, you know, it's going to bust? I'm, I'm telling you that this is, 
This is not like, oh, just another recession. Remember 1970, this is going to turn around. This is, this is the edge of a long, gradual decline. Gradual is good, but it's, it's a long decline unless we do something. And the positive part about this is that it's engineering that has the power to do something about it. There's kind of a PLM dilemma. You know, this is like the innovator's dilemma. But the PLM industry grew up on, I mean, if you, if, if, I could go to every single CAD company and go, what's your strategy? It's, well, it's auto, aero, and other. That we're, we're going to own those th industries and we'll make CAD systems for them. And some will fit it. Well, now, auto's in trouble. And aero is, you know, consolidating. And industrial machinery is all gone. And if we think about PLM, I actually did some calculations a few years back, and the reason that PLM was growing a little faster than the economy is because every company had to buy it so they could ship the jobs and the products overseas. Now that's going to end sometime, and then you have to ask, will the manufacturers someplace else want to keep buying this stuff now that they've got it all? Or will they come up with you know, China CAD and India CAD and things like that. And global, global supply chain was always kind of iffy as a competitive edge. But now that everything is being shipped on a container, it kind of doesn't matter anymore. You know, you're up to the, the risks that are attendant on shipping stuff in a container overwhelm whether you can get it 24 hours earlier or faster from your supplier down the road. So, so the issue there is, is, is you look at the behavior of all of us and we're stuck between trying to string out a few more meals with yesterday's secret sauce, which most CAD companies, most PLM companies do, or to start thinking about what's this new sauce look like that puts us back in a preeminent situation. And it's pretty, you know, you, yes? Uh, global supply chain, uh, expensive oil, is that cut that short? Well, what, what, the, the idea of the global supply chain was you could have instant, re, you know, react. I'm thinking about ERP, and 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 the, the 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 so the logic there was that you can beat every buddy down for low prices and get instant response and deliver stuff to your customers right away. Well, now that everybody is beaten down for prices, it's all come from China. You're not getting instant response to customers because it's coming on a cargo container. That the competitive edge to be, I, I never felt there was a huge competitive edge from putting SAP in to begin with, but whatever argument you made before is even weaker, weaker today. That was the point. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, innovation ethic. I've got a buddy, Sandy Monroe. He's been saying this for 20 years. He says, engineers create wealth, accountants count wealth, and lawyers suck wealth. <laughs> now, there are some cases where accountants actually can help add value, and, and we pointed before how justice is important, and a certain number of lawyers have a very helpful value in innovation. But by and large, if you're on a desert island, and you've got a bunch of people, you know, you're bringing people in, you want to survive, the accountants and lawyers are probably the last people you're going to invite. You know, you're going to want farmers, and, 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 and if you look at the last hundred years, most of the good stuff was happening from engineers and scientists and technologists. And yet, at the end of the 20th century, this is the Enron building, you know, we, we, had, we had this, the culture had changed. The, the old idea of free markets and everything is that anybody can have a great idea and create value, and then you get to keep some of it for yourself. And if you're really good at creating value, then you get to do it again and again and again, and that really worked. Well, now we had a whole bunch of people who said, you know, I think we can skip the, 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 the value adding stuff. That's hard. Skip that. Let's just go directly to value extraction. Let's find a way to skim some off the top. And that's Enron. That's subprime. That's lawyers, you know, making up uh, cases that did, did things. That has become a dominant part of, of a lot of cultures. Investment bankers who aren't fixing companies to make them better, they're fixing them to flip them. That happens. You know, there was a gal who, who t got a tattoo on her head. And, and I would love to see in the next hundred years a tattoo on everybody's head. So like three guys walk into a bar, you know, an investment banker and stuff like that, and the investment banker goes, you know, the tattoo is value added over value extracted. 
And, and so, that, you know, value added. Well, I actually didn't do any value. The companies were exactly the same. I left a shell. But boy, did I get a Porsche out of it. And, and you end up with this, like, very small fraction, maybe a negative fraction, and people could judge. Engineers, by and large, are the people who've got, like, a bigger number over the, the smaller number. And that's the kind of culture we need to get back, this kind of value-added culture. So where am I going with this? Um, we need, and I think the, the dialogue can begin right here, to think of what is this new secret sauce. And, and point, 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 I'll, I'll give some thoughts about some things that we might be able to do here. There's no reason, in fact, in some ways we are the world's most productive people still. We work harder than other folks. There's a tremendous ethic here. And, and we ought to be start thinking about health, maybe not so much in giveaways, but how do we have the most vigorous workforce? What do we, how do, let's frame health care on that thing. How do we put boomers, you know, we've got a bunch of baby boomers here. How many of you are unalterably opposed to doing something meaningful beyond the age of 65? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> no. And so the Dan Garves of the world ought to be figuring out how do we tap this resource? One of the things I didn't mention in the workforce is one of the great things, it had some downsides too, is we were the first country to tap women as part of the workforce. Started you know, really in World War II and the rest of that in, in great numbers. Well, we've got to tap everybody. And so tapping the boomers there. And, and, and immigration, our policies are so crazy about immigration, we, we all just have policies that make the country stronger. And that has to do with H-1B visas and, and who you let in. And how, I mean, we can do that. Uh, in terms of, of education, we've got some work to, to you know, get back to where we were in the secondary area. We've got, a, we've got still the strongest universities. We've got to secure that. Can't let that erode. But the other thing this country's had is kind of a commitment in an infrastructure of continuing education. There are more people more willing to get certified, to go back to school, to read on their own, to do something else in their life than in any other country. And really understanding that as a value is something that can make us productive. You, you heard my point about the value culture. I think that one of the... Uh, I'm an engineer, so I love engineers. But one of the things that, that we don't do enough is speak up for ourselves. You know, it used to be you judge somebody by what they did and accomplished. Now you judge them by what they drive. And... And, and so, so speaking up a little bit more about who's accomplished, if you're in the, how many people are here in the press? Anybody in the press? Yeah, so this is, this is part of your job of rewarding and recognizing when people add value and, and, and you know, calling the pot black when they're not adding value. That's how we turn that culture around. And can-do role models. I love what Dean Kamen's doing, and, and some of the companies here, like Autodesk, are investing in that. Of and 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 I, I mean, just in terms, like if we're going to tattoo something on Joel's forehead, it's going to be how many grandkids? Twenty-four. Twenty-four grandkids. You know, so so we can we can go from the self-improvement culture we had to excellence recognized and rewarded. And there's a huge opportunity. You know, if I were an HP or a Microsoft or an Autodesk. I would want to be spending part of my advertising dollars because uh, my customers are engineers of, of making this such an aspirational thing to be an engineer and to use my product. So that's, that's something we can do. In terms of uh, big, co big companies are like one that's shipping jobs overseas. Um, and they, they kind of have to do it with the trap they are in with short term profits and stuff like that. But we have a tremendous resource of small companies that, that you know, the, a lot of them family owned and the rest of that. And the question is, how do we make them more effective in a world economy? And I, and I think the model to think about is if you, if you uh, anybody here like a software entrepreneur that sold out to a bigger company? Anybody do that? So, yeah, so Buzz, perfect example here. So, so in, in the, the, the computer industry, the model is, it's pretty easy if you've got a bright idea to start a new company. But it's pretty hard to grow it to become a billion dollar company. So you come up with a smart idea and then you find an essential distribution channel in a bigger company. And so the bigger companies, they've got a, a part in the ecology, but, but the formation of new ideas works. And that's kind of how Audesk runs, isn't it Buzz? 
in terms of innovation. I mean, it's kind of a model. And, that's, and we need to extend that model to nuts and bolts. We, if, if I've got the idea for the world's greatest stainless steel, you know, quarter inch nut, I got to find a way to start that company and then sell it out to you know universal nuts and bolts. So that's an opportunity. That's what I meant by this motivated network communities. Uh, small company excellence. We've got to find a way to take all the intelligence and all we know about software and all we know about systems integration and make it work for little companies that can't afford the somewhat dysfunctional systems integration you know path we've got right now. We need freer markets and smarter cops. Um, uh, a conservative economist figured that if you if you factored in not pollution and all that stuff, but just the defense dollars that were purely aimed, and this was back in the 70s, at getting the oil out of the Gulf of Arabia, it added 100 bucks. We are, whether you know it or not, subsidizing oil. Not We're paying 100 bucks a barrel now, but we're subsidizing 100 bucks a barrel. We're subsidizing, you know, uh, corn for ethanol. You know, good intentions. You know, politicians are running it. No wonder it's stupid. Now, nobody, I mean, it's, it, it's amazing in presidential campaigns that, like, being as smart as an eighth grade science teacher is a bad thing. <laughs> And, and, and so we've got to, we've got to, we, free markets are absolutely vital, but to get them free, you've got to have cops around there to make sure that people aren't run away and stealing stuff. And we need even lower crime and corruption. That's, a, that's an advantage we've got, and, and we can uh, do that. So I, I think the future secret sauce is, isn't so much the big companies. There, there are a bunch of things. I mean, if you want to put in a fab facility, you need billions of dollars, and you've got to be a big company. But to, to kind of an all-size company leadership, it's, it's, it's kind of like packing gravel. You need big ones and little ones and small ones, and you pack them together, and it's so much stronger. And, and that's the kind of economy we need. And, and in part, for folks in this room, that means cracking this elusive SMB market. Um, in terms of, of the, the infrastructure, uh, the environment, we abs I'll talk a little bit more about energy and materials alternatives, but uh, the competitive advantage in the next 100 years is not going to go to the, the, the country that is best at pulling oil out of the ground. It's going to go to the country that has found a dozen other ways to get the energy it needs while still pulling oil out of the ground. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Saving, spending, and tax policy. We're a net debtor nation. We've got to, we've got to find a way to invest in ourselves, personally, at, at, at government levels and the rest of that. I talked uh, uh, several years ago about knowledge terms, the idea that you know, if you keep doing something, you get better. One of the things that happens, you know, if, I, if I give you a job to do because you you're willing to do it for less money than I am, you're not, you're not just buying the work, you're buying the knowledge terms. And so if I come back a little bit later and I want to take that work back from you, it turns out now you're better than that, than I, at that job than I ever was because of the experience curve and knowledge terms. So every time we ship a skill and a competency to somebody else, and, and one of the classic things with, with, with uh, trying to exploit the, the experience curve is do it, lose money up front to get the experience so you can do it cheaper later on. And we've seen all kinds of examples of this. HP front and running the sales of uh, workstations. You know, it was, the first year it, it cost them more. They actually lost money. But because it was a three or four or five year deal, they made huge amounts of money later on. So that's happening to us. We've got to figure out how not to let do that. Infrastructure repair. There is a huge opportunity. If you look at Every category of infrastructure, we've got sewers, roads, electric, and the rest of that. Uh, there has been very little innovation applied to figuring out how to fix that stuff simply, quickly, and effectively. How do we do it without shutting the road down for two years while our unmotivated workers hold signs saying, go slow, because we are too. And um, so, so, so and, and broadband is clearly one where we would benefit if we led the world in broadband. We're not. Because so many of the ways to, to be effective are going to rely on dispersed people kind of broadbanded together. Um, personal national security are uh, something that we can apply a lot of technology to. And, and one, of the, one of the, you know, I did a, a kind of comparison of candidates when we, before we did our primary. And, and one of them's talking about less government. But none of them are talking really about efficient government. 
we got a bunch of problems that require large scale that need government but we can't afford we don't have the money anymore to have anything less the government that's like like you know like 99 cents of every dollar does some good and so I, I guess we're like sitting at 70 I mean 60 who knows what percent we are right now and part of this is the problems we face are complex. We'll talk more about that later. So we, we need to start embracing complexity and not have these simple, like, like a lot of people for the secret sauce will say, it's all taxes, or it's all investment, or it's all free markets. The fact is, it's all 16 of those ingredients together, and it's complicated, there's not a single variable, and we're going to have to get used to, uh, to dealing with that. Technology at the scale of life. Um, so we need to, more investment in R&D. But we're also discovering these ideas of challenge awards. First person into space. In, uh, in the Bay Area, there was a challenge award to get a, a, a bridge that had failed because of a fire in record time. And, and if you give people a challenge, that's a very, very effective way of getting new technology developed. Uh, higher order process innovation. So it's, it's not just like, like, like within the silos, but across the silos. Low cost systems integration. That's how we're going to get the small and medium sized companies there. And I'll talk a little bit about 3D. How many folks here are kind of like, I mean, we, we must have like a dozen kind of uh, 3D purveyors. We've got the big ones and a bunch of small ones. How many, yeah, so, so that's, that's sitting there too. If you look at the problem solving opportunity, so you know the issue is in in the year 2100, what will they look back and say we accomplished in the last hundred years? And the way you you innovate is you have to have some problems, and I will say that we are blessed with problems. Uh, I, I roughly kind of did, we've got these trillion dollar problems like energy and healthcare and government stupidity and personal stupidity and infrastructure and French cuff gangs, these are like investment bankers and terrorist gangs. And then we've got hundred billion dollar problems like, you know, fixing, and, 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 but the problems we're hearing about on the nightly news are like these one million dollar problems about, you know, somebody who ripped off something and slept with some prostitutes they shouldn't have. And I mean, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're important issues, but we got lots of stuff most of which have engineering solutions to work on for the next hundred years. I just, probably at the top of this list is this issue of energy uh, and scarce materials. And, and I think one way, people will argue about any given point, but there are seven reasons why continuing to rely on fossil fuels for all of our energy is a bad idea. And all you have to do is get people to go for one out of seven, and we ought to be able to galvanize some action. First is we have finite supplies. I mean, regardless of when you run out, sometime you run out. The second is the costs are rising. It is a drag. It's like carrying a ball and chain on the economy when you have these rising costs. The third is that we're in conflict. Conflict, one of which is costing trillions of dollars, and that's just the beginning of the conflicts over water, uh, the conflicts in Africa over, over steels and things like that. The dollars are going into unfriendly hands. You know, uh, I've toured, you know, planes being made for Saudi Arabian princes. And these are not like your, your 20th century heroes. These are, these are, they're, they're, they're obscenely rich folks who would not normally be our friends if if it wasn't for the fact they have oil and they're willing to keep supplying it to us. And a lot of that money is leaking out to folks that, that frankly, intend us no, no good. Uh, there's this ownership issue. Uh, you know, we talked before about now someone sleeping in your bedroom. 20%, well, and, I, and I don't think it's the end of the, the world that 20% of our assets are owned primarily by Arabs, now increasingly the Chinese. But it does f flavor the decision of companies when the leading stakeholder, and today if you own 20% of a company as, as, as investment folks have shown, you kind of control it. It does change things when, when that's there. Uh, there's climate change, you've heard about that, and there's pollution. In fact, it turns out that some of the pollution we've been putting in the air has actually been moderating the effects of global warming because it reflects some of the sun and causes global cooling. So, so pick your cocktail of mix, but this is one of the huge issues we face 
uh, from an engineering standpoint over the next years. And the question is, when are we going to get in gear and do something about it? It's kind of hard. To, I put together a pie chart of where energy goes, and, and there's tons and tons of data, but none of it, it, it's all from like somebody's perspective, the gas institute and the oil institute and stuff. And, uh, and so how much is transportation? And one of the surprises for me is water heating is a huge amount of energy. But, and, and I actually found this. My wife left um, to see her sister for a month, and our electric bill dropped. Now, I'm the one who leaves the lights on. She's the one who's good about turning them off. But just we have you know, electric uh, hot water heat, and boom, 70 bucks less electric bill, just like that. And, and uh, now we'll, when I leave, we'll find out about the lights. But, um, the, uh, and there's, 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 there's process water, steam and stuff like that. Uh, as an engineering problem, you know, a way of, getting so of using less hot water is a solvable problem. Just like transportation is a solvable problem, just like lighting is a solvable problem, we, we could easily cut uh, a third of our consumption through conservation and, and there are this huge host of solar and geothermal and, and heat pumps in Arizona and nuclear of replacement technologies that would mean at the very least we can buy you know, oil from people that, that are kind of like our buddies. So fossil fuel alternatives, transportation and, and if you think of every single product that's out there today probably needs to be redesigned to be more energy efficient. What a bonanza for mechanical engineers. Every building the same way. What a bonanza for civil engineers. So guiding principles. I've got three and then we're going to kind of open this up a little bit. One is, is one of the reasons that, you know, like did anybody have, like the nanotechnology, uh, you know, presentation was cool, but, but it, maybe I was the only person I go, so what's it good for? And that's how people react to engineers in, in general. And <laughs> so, so what's it good for? And, and, and so I put up Maslow's hierarchy of needs here. Just to ground, it's like, like if somebody says, I've got this new technology, go, well, is that going to keep me alive? Or is that going to be a peak experience? I mean, just, just place what I'm doing on that chart. and That might help a little bit. So what I mean by this technology, the scale of life, we heard about the tragedy of the commons. You know, we've got too many people and we're, it's going to collapse or we're going to go up and down. Ken did a good job of going that. That's an issue we face. A lot of that is driven by population increases. We had the question before of, of how come the richest people in the world have like 1.5 kids, you know, and the poorest people have like nine kids, most of whom die in a thing. Well, it really is an economic kind of a deal. If you feel poor, it's like, let's manufacture a bunch of kids while we can, and they'll take care of us in our old age, and they'll work the farm and the rest of that. And, that, and that, that's really the driver behind this thing. So if we could just make all, all those people in the blue, the billions, if we could just somehow make them feel that they were rich, that would drop the thing. Now, the, the, the way they get the kids, if you have electrification, you're probably rich. If you have, if you, if you can stay in school and get a high school thing, your family's probably rich. That's why the, the coincidence of, of uh, uh, lowering things here. So, so let's look at that as an engineering problem. Can we get abundance at the fraction of the cost? If you actually look at what it takes to live, it's pretty cheap. We spend 1% of our gross domestic product on agriculture. 1%. I mean, probably for 20% of gross domestic product, we could, we could have all the food that was good for us, uh, a pretty good roof over our heads. Uh, I mean, you could, you, could, you could get basic needs and safety needs. What's expensive is the stuff we need for self-actualization and psychological needs. I mean, like, as part of the engineering community, I have to buy, like, really expensive computers, and I have to have a lot of tools, and, you know, a, a boat isn't for me, but I've got, like, you know, so, so the stuff is, is, is what's expensive higher up there. And we'll see later some ways of getting that cheaper. Now, even if stuff equals happiness, how many people buy, buy that stuff equals happiness? I mean, I've, I've been kind of there. Less can be more. <coughs> This is Maslow's hierarchy of flashlights. Um, <laughs> I just went around and grabbed all the flashlights that I could, I didn't get them all. I mean, there's probably another 10 hiding around in corners and stuff like that. And so there are all these, and some of these flashlights are these six volt lantern batteries, and the one that the little one sitting on top of is a five, you know, D cell, you know, uh, mag light that doesn't last very long. But it turns out that the little one on top, the Phoenix, you know, flashlight, 
is brighter than any of the others. 210 lumens. And uh, it's smaller than any of the others. And if you put it on any one of its six modes, you can actually get a perfectly acceptable light that will last 70 hours for one set of flashlights. So in terms of the power goes out, all these flashlights meet my basic needs and going down the stairs and safety needs, but only this one light is self-actualized. And, 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 and so, and, and, and my, my point is, is, what I'm really trying to say here is that, that, that you know, we've been in this, this kind of quandary where quantity equals cool. And so we make the trip to Walmart and we go, oh goody, there's a thousand items I can buy really cheap today, but I'll be good. I'll only get 500 of them. Uh, now, I, I see in my own kind of research on buyers and stuff, people are going, you know, I just as soon have one that lasted a while, that worked a little better. I'd rather say I have 10 crummy things, I'd like to have one that's kind of fun to use. And so that's an opportunity for designing stuff that people want to want to get. That's and that's where the scale of life stuff comes in. The problem with PLM as we have it right now is that it's all about the product and not how the product makes people feel. Uh, we've talked before about Harley Davidson is part of the experience. I mean, as a piece of engineering, it's actually not as good as a Honda, but as an experience, is better. The, the neon is, a, is, is underneath the same thing as a PT Cruiser, but the PT Cruiser makes more money and has more happy people and stuff because they understand. And the same thing, this, the, you, you go into an iPod and it's the same memory, the same hard drives. They didn't even make the user interface and all the quick dial stuff themselves. It's an understanding of experience. Until we get product lifecycle management and companies that support it, that understand engineering in the context of how it makes customers feel, we will not have done our job. And if we do that, we can be world leaders again in cool products and rise up Maslow's hierarchy of flashlights. Un un unfortunately, that one flashlight, which costs 65 bucks, is made in China. So that's, you know, it's saying the Chinese can't innovate is not true. We also need to embrace complexity. You know, Einstein said things should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. What he didn't recognize is that we as humans love simplicity to the extent that we take overly simplistic solutions to most of our problems. So if we go back to the list I had of all those problems, only the nightly news, you know, Brittany, get a clue, is simple. All the other stuff is multiple variables, very complicated. Uh, you, you can't understand it with a simple heuristic. We need folks at least as smart as engineers to figure this stuff out. And in our own systems, we, I mean, we literally need to say, give me the complexity and let me do the best I can sort it out. We'll say for later the conversation Joel and I had about just, you know, uh, laws need like a version one, two, three to get it right and, and, uh, and so on. Uh, it, it turns out that that Ken heard from Brad, who heard from me, who came 10 years late to the uh, Logic of Failure book, originally written in Germany. But there was this fascinating study that was done of how people make decisions. And it was, they did simulations of people trying to run a machine to get optimum output, or trying to run a society so it wouldn't collapse and the rest of that. And what he found is that people, including grad students in psychology, you know, PhD candidates, make very, very common uh, mistakes when confronted with a complex system. First, I mean, you can, you can like try this on the Iraq War. Do we have clear, we start with unclear priorities, and then you focus on a single variable, like get rid of the bad guy, and then you, instead of waiting a while to understand, like does anybody here speak, you know, uh, 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 know anything about religions and stuff, you go into action, you prepare only for success, you mistake short-term gains for longer-term solutions, mission accomplished. You misunderstand time lags between the actions and reaction. Uh, you're unwilling to change tactics in the face of failure. These stubborn attempts to preserve a sense of confidence. So in his studies, like, like their primitive society on the computer was like dying and the, you know, the agriculture was collapsing. And, but boy, they were really working on literacy. And, 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 and the whole issue here is just one of human scale versus problem scale. We truly have developed you know, marvelous mental apparatus to solve problems, but the problems are growing faster 
then gut feel can, can, can get us there. So if anybody's going to help with this, it ought to be us. So we don't have to start not simulating just, well, I can simulate the airbag problem. I can do, you know, closely coupled finite element analysis. We actually have to start simulating human outcomes. What's it feel like to uh, customers? How's that going to change? That will, that will help get us into the next century. If you wanted any evidence to prove that people make decisions motivated by emotion and then logic, there's no better example than the current year's political campaign. Now we've got a bunch of really like rational folks here, and I'm not going to let Dave Ullman do this because he's trying to get people to do the rational thing. But how many of you actually listed all of the issues and then did at least a paragraph detailed analysis for every issue and how the various candidates stood? Anybody do that? Yeah, I, I, I did that too. And this guy's actually got a spreadsheet. But the problem is people... <laughs> He's, he's been trying to convince people to do it. And, what Dave, and it's really cool stuff, but, but that's not how people want to do stuff. Instead, we, I mean, like the last election, you know, four years ago, 51% of the nation thought, that George Bush is a good guy who I could see kind of having a beer with, who's actually accomplished something in his life. And that Kerry is an elitist snob who's never done anything except for the politics. And 49% thought, that Bush guy, he's not too smart and he's being led around by the nose. But now, now that Kerry guy, there's an honorable guy who's really going to do something. And we, and we made these gut feel decisions. And, and gut is often a real good way of making fast decisions. And I'm not saying don't do it because it's very, very powerful. But, you know, if you've got some issues to look at and there's maybe a little bit of engineering to do, maybe that's, you know, worth adding into the, into the equation. So we have to fight that. What we do know is that in products, that if you've got the product that's got both the, the emotional motivation and the rational motivation, that's how you get a killer product. You know, so it's like, like uh, Christy Brinkley will sit next to you in this new car. Uh, and by the way, it has great resale value. So... <coughs> There is this human parallel processing. I won't spend a lot of time on it. But we literally, it's almost like we have three computers in our head. We can actually track this physiologically and the rest of that. We've got this cognitive apparatus, and engineers inhabit only the cognitive apparatus most of the days. We have this normative uh, uh, you know, thing, which is like, what did my parents tell me growing up, and what's my peer group tell me, and the rest of that. And then we have this kind of wire. Someday, they, they will actually want to know your genome, because they'll sell you different stuff you know, based on genetic differences. All three of those... Are, are active at any given time. And if we're designing products and trying to get solutions and get people convinced, we have to, we have to talk to all three parts of those brains, our brains. So if we ask, why do companies buy Nike sneakers? Surely it's because of the hysteresis curves and the elastomers and the soles and the return on energy bound, right? Or is it because Michael Jordan told them to? See, I mean, they all apply there. You know, the reason g kids are willing to kill for Nikes doesn't have anything, to, I guarantee, about the engineering characteristics that they're intimately, you know, aware of. Uh, it, it, it applies to those other levels. So, and then the last guiding principle here is maybe use pixels to do more of the heavy lifting. A way to think about this is, suppose I said, um, in a year, you're not allowed to move, but in a year there's going to be a fire that will wipe out every possession you have. We'll give you all the help you want. You have a terabyte to back up your life. Only and one. You, yeah, she's got only one, <laughs> but because this is petty research. But 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 I mean, we've come the way where well, the family pictures are good. I've got like a bunch of art in my wall that I only look at. Um, I've got way too many. I mean, we could do it. We could certainly take the sting out of losing everything physical by backing up our life. Uh, you know, uh, all my music is now, you know, so, so we, can, we can kind of back up our lives, but it goes even further than that. If we, how do we measure our results as engineers? Uh, is it on that Maslow curve? Is it happiness? You know, we're not the happiest people right now. The, the latest study says the Danes are. We don't know how that happens. They spend 55% of the government on taxes um, and, uh, you know, whatever. But, but it isn't, it isn't just the stuff you've got, it's other things that, that, that matter. And that's where some of this experience issue comes in. And the Danes too? Yeah, the farther north you get the, the, and the less sun, the, the suicide rates go up with that. Yeah. So, so somebody may recognize this 
This was from, from NASA, talking about kids today kind of living a digital life. And, and, and so, so much of the interaction is now on the web that you can literally see, you know, we, we talked I think three years ago about communities, about, you know, second life, that it is inevitable that increasingly we're going to be moving parts of our existence, parts of our feelings of I'm doing good, parts of who's in my community, onto the web. We've seen the globalization of the work, the globalization of the I mean, You can just go down the whole list. More and more of, of the world is going on pixels. And that's got some good things with it because they don't cost as much to create as the products. Don't use as much energy. Don't use as much resources. Lots of cautions. I mean, anybody who's a fan of uh, 1984 or the Matrix or the Minority Report or uh, yeah, uh, any of these issues will know that, that every single problem we've got in the real world we're going to get in the virtual world at, uh, at, at some point. So we've got we've to deal with these issues, but it is an opportunity that 3D has a role in. And so perhaps we'll end up with, uh, we live our physical life uh, you know, in a, a tight knit community and, and the rest of that. I mean, there's a bunch of companies here, like, you know, uh, where you live where you want, you got your buddies, small company, and yet our work connections are across the globe. That's one way to think about being sustainable. So, the bottom line for all this is, is that one of the kinds of conversations we should be having over the next days is what does this new secret sauce for the next five, ten, whatever number of years look like. If I were a Dassault or a PTC or a Siemens, you know, what do I do to uh, bring engineering back to the forefront to help small companies, particularly the Autodesk and things? So every, regardless of who you are, think, well, how can I help? And one of the things we're going to have at 3:30 on Saturday, that's this issue. Is you know, we've, everybody has anybody here been to the Congresses before? Yeah, like total drag, right? <laughs> um, so we are going to try something slightly different, and that's to have two Congresses, one kind of focused, kind of on the near term, you know, next five years, one focused longer term. So you could think, gee, it takes a long time to build buildings. Maybe that's longer term. That's the silver guys. Shorter time, you know, for the uh, products. Maybe that's the near term. And actually have you think about, come prepared with like this 90 second commercial of here's an ingredient that I think belongs in the secret sauce for innovation. And it could be uh, it could be an educational program. It could be a piece of software that's not invented. It could be doing something that you've done. And we will try in extreme rapid fire to get those ideas out. And then we'll vote at the very end to see which is the coolest idea. And I, I understand that as part of engineering's new secret sauce, you actually have a prize. This, this ability to go zooming into the future on what is apparently, like Joel, you know, uh, just before he tried this, he was 30 pounds heavier and had a frown on his face. And, and, and now he is like weightlifting and running up tall mountains and stuff like that. So apparently this is a very good thing. So we're going to have a prize for the, uh, the, the best idea amongst all, uh, all these of uh, secret sauce. Also, for those who are interested, I, I, there's an idea I've been really keen about that 11.50 Friday I'll be talking about of kind of an, it's, it's a, uh, a way to reach small and medium-sized businesses to revolutionize systems integration, make a bunch of money, but also train a bunch of small company engineers how to make a, a real difference. So it's kind of one of these win-win kind of things. So if you've got a VAR channel or you've got a vendor with cool technology, I'd love to have you in that 1150 uh, analyst briefing because I think it's a pretty cool idea. Um, so whoever you are, if you're press, how am I going to contribute? How am I going to make engineering cool again? If I'm an educator, you know, how do I change the education? If I'm doing decision support, how do I make it how do I get the, the soft part, the, you know, uh, the emotional part into that? If I'm making applications, what are the applications? 3D, maybe how do I participate in digital life? And so on throughout this thing. What am I going to do to move forward beyond yesterday's old tired secret sauce to creating the next secret sauce? Joel, questions, thoughts to add to this? Uh, anything? Any, any questions or comments or thoughts? Uh, here, I've been blasting away here. I apologize for that. 
Yes. Like we're talking about uh, unmotivated uh, employees. Yes. Uh, the last couple of years, uh, trying to fundraise for new ideas, I also find uh, very unmotivated investors and uh, even uh, investing thinking in companies. Yeah. Right. And it turns to be that you're competing against other investments that have much more uh, time. Yeah. Right? So their time to uh, liquidation event yep. is much better than anything that a real engineering project. Uh, you know, needs in order to yeah, yeah, absolutely. Here, here's the good news: that the ability to make money out of thin air by fooling people has now dissipated enough that we're actually going to have to go back and earn money the old-fashioned way. I think so. So I just, just like like four dollars a gallon oil has a great silver lining. I actually think that that some of the issues, you know, right now people would kill to get five percent return on their investments. You know, a real... You also have resource constraints, right? I understand, I understand. So I, it, it's a real issue, and we, we absolutely should discuss it, um, but, I, but I actually think that in the next, that the current, you're, you know, 5%, I and mean, how many people here would like to have had 5% over the last, uh, uh, you know, it, it, that'd be good. So, and, 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 and we can get 10, 15, 20 percent. We can't, we can't create Enron-like successes. We can't create, you know, you can't get, uh, as, as somebody on the radio the other day was making a million dollars selling subprime stuff. That stuff isn't going to happen, but, but that I, stuff was never... Yeah. If it's not 20x, yeah. uh, a loan, like a, a VC will not step yeah. into it. Yeah. I yeah. 20x, if you're talking for yeah. 10, 15 million dollars, that's... We, we can talk more about this, but there are other, some other sources of funding if you've got to prove in 20x. Any other, yes, any other questions, thoughts? Yes? Just a question. Is the secret sauce, going kind of back to Ken's talk, do you think the secret sauce for the last 100 years was good? It seems like... like Actually, I do. I do. I, I think the... Uh, uh, I think it's great that life expectancy went from 45 to 75. I think it's great that we learned so much about physics and science and chemistry. I think it's great that um, so much of the world was lifted out of poverty. Uh, I, we made trade-offs, some unwitting. Right? You know, right now in China, they, they say, we envy your blue skies. They're making a conscious trade-off, maybe the right one, maybe not the right one, to have really crummy air in order to have enough money to lift the people out of poverty. How important is like, setting the goals of the, the secret sauce? Like we're going to try and create these ingredients in the secret sauce. Yeah. But is the first that changing or, or thinking about the metrics of the sauce? Like what are we shooting for? No. So, so my only answer to that would be uh, I don't think um, that we can centrally plan the secret sauce. I think that, that people will decide whether they like it or not, and their response will judge the success of it. What we can do is mindful that there are resource constraints, mindful that, that you know, the things on our agenda, we can suggest ingredients to this that we think are headed in the right direction. And then we kind of kind of mix it together and try, that wasn't right, and, 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 and over the next hundred years, make progress that gives us the quality of life, the advancement of life, without, you know, uh, portion of the plans in the process. So that would be my answer to that question. Yeah. And, 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 so I'll talk to you later. Yeah, but, 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 I have a question. Does it make sense to outsource making the CCs? Because, uh, your sauce. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you eventually want to uh, outsource eating it as well. Uh, all right, thank you very much, Ron, to uh,